In his book, The Camp of Saints, written in 1973, French author and explorer Jean Raspail depicts the destruction of Western civilization through mass, uncontrolled third world immigration. His book is eerie in its prescience as it describes that as a direct result of its left-wing decadence and self-hatred, Europe fails to realize the threat it faces until migrants land and begin their pillaging. Now that fiction has become reality and the example of mass third world migrants just showing up at the borders of western nations and ramming their way through the gates has been set, this same tactic is now being attempted by groups heading toward the United States. A caravan of saints, if you will, of more than 1,200 Central American migrants pushing toward the U.S. border with demands of not only the right to enter the U.S., but be given dignified work as well as having others, the U.S. presumably, fix the nations from whence they came. Regardless of this caravan of saints and its ultimate goal and the inevitable caravans to come, what does it mean to have groups of people from parts of the world with very different levels of competence and ability arrive in highly developed nations? Moreover, how will this affect not only the migrants themselves, but the host nation? There are many uncomfortable facts in this world, many that are socially taboo, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. It is, however, a well-known fact that a person's intelligence will have a profound effect on various life outcomes, whether they be education, income, or conversely, the probability of engaging in criminal activity. What is less known and mostly suppressed is that average national IQ also corresponds with outcomes at a national level. All basic requirements for modern civilization, democracy, education, wealth, health, and lack of crime and corruption are strongly related to a nation's average general IQ. In their controversial book, IQ and the Wealth of Nations by Richard Lynn and Tattoo Van Hannen, the psychologists have presented staggering correlations between average national IQ and income, education, crime, corruption, and democracy. Coincidentally, of course, all of the things that the Caravan of Saints is demanding be addressed in their highly dysfunctional and poverty-ridden Central American homelands. It is, however, important to remember that all people from every group on Earth are individuals, and an average IQ of a group does not mean that all people within that group are the same intelligence, whether that be high or low. But intelligence and the understanding of it, as is stressed by the likes of Dr. Jordan Peterson, is well understood. That said, to even speak of differences between groups is essentially forbidden, and even when academic research surfaces that contradicts this most cherished and holy tenant in the modern West, all discussion of the topic is labeled at best controversial and in general as simply hate-filled. That's why when a 2010 study headed by Randy Thornhill from the University of New Mexico came to the conclusion that people in developing countries have lower IQs because their bodies divert energy from brain power to fighting disease, well, it was met with the usual howls, rage, and indignation that is meted out by those that are professionally offended on the behalf of others. Thornhill's research suggests that in hot nations, Blighted by deadly infections, the priority is survival and populations have evolved to develop stronger immune systems rather than intelligence. Professor Emeritus Richard Lynn of Ulster University, while saying the picture was complicated, did admit in an ironic twist that low national IQs partly helped to propagate the spread of infectious diseases. It should also be noted that it has been suggested that environment can also have a positive effect on IQ, which up until a few years had been said to be increasing since the 1930s thanks to better living conditions and education, a trend known as the Flynn effect. Conversely, there are also studies that have shown the average IQ of Westerners to have plunged 10 points or more since Victorian times. Whatever the case may be regarding the why of average group IQ, it's not important for the purposes of this presentation, as one can easily see the correlation between a country's development and the nation's average national IQ. All of the countries with an average national IQ of 98 and above, with the exception of China, are all highly developed nation states. Moreover, it would appear that the IQ breaking point on whether a nation can develop and modern civilization can be maintained at appears to be between 95 and 97. Below that, 
things tend to become murky and when an average IQ of a nation is 90 and below, this would be the breaking point at which civilization and its accompanying accoutrements, democracy, education, wealth, health, and lack of crime and corruption cannot be created or maintained independently. When looking at the top 31 countries with an average national IQ of 98 and above, all with the exception of Mongolia and China are highly developed nations. However, if we are looking for a point at which modern civilization begins to crumble, any country with a national average intelligence of 85 and below, with the exception of wealthy oil states, are all countries that struggle with poverty as well as social and institutional dysfunction. While a country can, of course, still have developmental challenges with a high average IQ, they seem to be more of a product of political environment rather than human resources of that country, North Korea, for example. But it would seem to correlate that a national IQ of 97 is a necessary condition for a nation's success. Thus, this brings us full circle to the conundrum of the Caravan of Saints, now descending on the US as well as the larger implications that this thought experiment provides. Honduras, where the majority of people in this caravan are from, and demanding entrance to the US, have a national average IQ of 81. To put this another way, the vast majority of the Hondurans in this caravan would most likely not even be eligible for military service in the US and would only most likely be able to find low-skilled repetitive work in low-wage jobs. While these kinds of jobs, weed cleaning, dishwashing and the like are all needed and very necessary for society to function, there is unfortunately already a glut of people in this IQ range that already live in the US and are unemployed. There is absolutely no gain for the native population in countries like the US and in Europe to unconditionally accept people from nations with low average national IQ. Arguments that over the generation the IQ of these people can be improved based on environment, stress, compunction, and that receiving nations are nothing more than intellectual colonies to be used by others to better their collective group IQ over the long run. On the other hand, to have selective immigration of the kind President Donald Trump is positing is also morally bankrupt as it amounts to nothing more than headhunting the best and brightest from the nations and skimming them off where such people are already desperately needed to help raise the quality of life for all in their native lands. Moreover, the massive uncontrolled flows of people as we've witnessed in the last decade ramming into both Europe and the US could actually pose a very serious risk to the long-term stability of nations and communities that are close to the IQ breaking point of 97 to 98. In that, in the delirious haze of pathological altruism, nations who are right on the breaking point are rapidly filling with immigrants from some of the lowest IQ nations on earth. Unlike the groups with the highest IQ in the world in East Asia, nations like Italy, Germany, France, and the US, among others, are in danger of seeing their stable, democratic, low crime, low corruption, and wealthy modern societies crumble and devolve. Perhaps it's time to admit that the social imperatives that have driven policy in Western nations since at least the 1960s have not only failed, but are a very real and present danger to the continuation of these developed societies. It is clear that more people can be helped at a lower cost in their countries of origin than traveling halfway across the world to benefit in a society many of them will never be able to function in in any meaningful way. But again, to take this tact also poses the dilemma of endless self-flagellation in the West and the fear of being accused of being colonial and intellectually imperialistic. Either way, the West has painted itself into a corner, whereas to protect their societies from devolving is morally wrong, whereas to help societies outside the West to progress intellectually is also morally wrong as it betrays the foundation myth of universal intellectual equality of all peoples. Either way, the caravan of saints along with the boats crossing the Mediterranean Sea are looming on the horizon, as are the millions and billions of others wanting to make the same journey to escape the dysfunction and failure of the societies that they are inadvertently by arriving importing to the West. 
The only solution I can see is for the West to break the self-imposed mental shackles of guilt and work on real solutions that not only protect the peoples in destination countries, but also work to better the lives and societies of nations that cannot seem to do so for themselves. Reality will come back to the West one way or another. Better it come through choice than uncontrollable circumstance. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of material, please consider subscribing. Also, follow me on the usual social media. Till next time.